Hello, uh, today we're going to discuss I Am a Cat uh, by Natsumi Soseki. Um, and uh, first, a little bit of review, and then we're going to jump into background and the text itself and discuss some of the homework questions. Um, so, uh, sometimes I'll give you the background before you read a text. Uh, in this case, we'll just do the background uh, as we're discussing the text. Um, it basically determines how much I want you to know going into a reading. In this case, I wanted you to um, not have a in-depth background um, for reasons we don't need to go into here. Um, so first, uh, just some quick review. Uh, we talked about round characters who are both complex and undergo development. And that second half, undergo development, is something I want you to key in on. And we talked about flat characters, characters who are simple and do not undergo development, have epiphanies or change in a major way. Um, and how we talked about how uh, flat characters uh, can sometimes be used to universalize the character, help you identify, or in other times it can be used to um, resist uh, your urge to identify with the character. Like uh, uh, Daphne in the Kugumas episode, we didn't, uh, he didn't want you to identify or sympathize with Daphne. And then satire, which, uh, was both the Kugumas episode and it's also going to be today's reading, I Am a Cat. It's a comedy or drama that criticizes individual flaws and or social traditions. Okay, so with the Kugumas episode, we talked about midlife crisis. You could see a way that it could be a, uh, um, a criticism or a critique of masculinity in America, um, how it could be a, a critique of teaching perhaps, right? Uh, or uh, higher education in some ways. Um, we talked about with uh, Allegory of the Cave symbols, a word, place, character, or object that means something beyond what it is on a literal level, uh, peace sign, um, dove, Nazi symbol, etc. Um, then we talked about, we talked about allegories. Uh, many interconnected symbols or figures in such a way that nearly every element of the narrative has a meaning beyond the literal level. Um, and so that's a good place to jump into I Am a Cat by Natsumi Soseki. So I Am a Cat is a satirical novel written in 1905 to 1906 by Natsumi Soseki about Japanese society during the, and I don't know how to pronounce this exactly, but let's say Ma Maijai period. Um, and it's basically the late 19th century. Uh, particularly a satire of the uneasy mix of Western culture and Japanese traditions. Although it is also a satire of numerous other things as well, which we can talk about as we go over the reading. So Soseki's original title, of which there's no exact translation, uses a high register phrasing more appropriate to a nobleman, conveying self-importance and intended to sound ironic, since the speaker is an anthropomorphized domestic cat. And it's just an ordinary house cat, but the title was to indicate um, uh, nobility. So this house cat is noble, right? Um, so it's lost in the translation a little bit, but it's still important to note that the author was intending for that to be the case. Um, and so anthropomorphism is to ascribe human form or attributes to an animal, plant, material, object, etc. Um, and just, uh, um, this isn't important, I'm not going to uh, um, uh, focus on this, but uh, just so you know, there's a slight difference between personification and anthropomorphism. Um, you could read through those definitions, but basically personification is uh, portraying a non-human in ways that seems human, uh, where anthropomorphism is the non-human is human. 
Uh, so in this case, and what, what's meant by that, in this case, the cat is anthropomorphized. Uh, so that cat is uh, acting in many ways like a human or through the lens of a human. Um, where if you say, uh, um, um, if you say that uh, uh, a plant um, has an arm or something like that, um, it's that's not the best example but um that's a personification in a way um the eyes of the lily stared back at me you know something like that um so now um so seki is generally judged to be the greatest novelist of that period when the influence from the west was arriving in japan in almost overwhelming waves uh this is called influence of the west is called uh, cultural imperialism and uh, um, in part he would he died a short life he died in his 40s um, and and because of that he really captured the essence of that period and and was one of those authors that they just said and ca uh, captured the um, thoughts and feeling of the moment in history um, so he captured the essence of what uh, that period struggled with, the enormous possibility and problems posed by interactions with the West. So, um, and cultural imperialism is a policy of extending a country's power and influence in this way through culture, right? So American values are often um, portrayed and, and pushed throughout the world by something like Hollywood or our music industry, uh, and that would be a form of cultural imperialism. Um, so what themes do you think would be common in literature from a period like that? Um, I want you to think about that a little bit. I'll, I'll talk about one or two, but there's many themes. Uh, uh, first, a cultural unease um, uh, that you're just not sure of uh, you're questioning your traditions, you're fearing what's coming, um, so a fear, right? Um, you're questioning what's important about your past and your traditions and your customs and what could be eschewed for a more modern Western lifestyle. Um, and you begin questioning almost everything about your culture and you start questioning what's real, what's not, what's um, um, truly it means to be Japanese in a globalized world. And that's uh, uh, what this author was wrestling with. So let's dig into the story. And I think as we uh, go over some of the story, I think it'll get at some of the questions from the homework. <clears throat> so we're gonna read, uh, uh, multiple sections from the text, and then we'll discuss them a bit. So, I am a cat, but as yet I have no name. Okay, so, a cat with no name. Our first clue, our first thought is, oh, if he doesn't have a name, must, good hint, he might be a flat character, right? Um, and you might want to think, if, if something has no name like that, um, what does that indicate? Um, it indicates perhaps a lack of care, perhaps not knowing who their parents are. Um, it also, it could be used in the same way a flat character can be used to universalize an experience in some ways. I haven't the faintest idea of where I was born. The first thing I do remember is that I was crying meow, meow, somewhere in a gloomy, damp place. It was there I met a human being for the first time in my life. Okay, so he has no name. He doesn't know where he's from. He doesn't remember anything except crying in this awful place. And that's where he meets a human being. Though I found this all out at a later date, I learned that this human being was called a student one of the most ferocious of the human race. I also understand that these students sometimes catch us, cook us, and then take to eating us. 
But at that time, I did not have the slightest idea of all this, so I wasn't frightened a bit. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, so we're seeing the world through the eyes of a cat, um, and this cat is claiming that students are the most ferocious. Um, of course, I work with students, so I know they can be very ferocious. Um, but reading this from a Western American lens, it's easy to think, oh, um, there's all these uh, cultural rumors and with some basis of truth underneath that uh, uh, different Asian societies have eaten um, dogs or cats at different points. Um, for the most part, most of it is a cultural myth, um, though there are some places, isolated places, where it has occurred. Um, and so, uh, um, so part of this could be true. He could be referring to that practice that was very limited but did occur. Um, and on the other hand, it could just be he's afraid of this human. And so there's all these myths uh, surrounding this human. Um, also, it's important to remember that probably at this time in history, um, most cats and dogs were wild, right? So eating a wild animal isn't considered controversial in most history and most cultures. Um, I also understand that these are... But at the time, I did not have the slightest idea of all this, so I wasn't frightened a bit. When the student placed me on the palm of his hand and lifted me up lightly, I had only had the feeling of floating around. After a while, I got used to this position and looked around. This was probably the first time I had a good look at a so-called human being. Okay, so the cat is completely helpless. He's doesn't have any control over his life right now. He doesn't know where he is, doesn't know uh, where he came from, he doesn't know his name, and the student has complete control over his body. What impressed me as being most strange still remains deeply embedded in my mind. The face, which should have been covered with hair, was a slippery thing similar to what I now know to be a tea kettle. I have since come across many other cats, but none of them are such freaks. Moreover, the center of the student's face protruded to a great extent, and from the two holes located there, he would often emit smoke. I was extremely annoyed by being choked by this, that this was what they term as tobacco I came to know recently. I was snuggled up comfortably in the palm of the student's hand, when after a while, I start to travel around at a terrific speed. I was unable to find out if the student was moving or if it was just myself that was in motion. But in any case, I was terribly dizzy and a little sick. Okay, so doesn't know where he is, doesn't know who he is, doesn't know where he's from. Cold, damp place, being thrown around by this student. Uh, views humans as monsters, right? So at this point, I want you to think about why the author would use this framing technique, this anthropomorphized uh, cat, um, and why that could uh, let the reader in on some insights that they might not otherwise think of, uh, what that framing does. Okay, so... Um, just want to point out we're going to read a longer section here but uh, this we're going to come back to this idea uh, so the cat says fate is strange if that hole had not been there I might have starved to death by the roadside so I want you to think of fate this idea that I don't have any control there's a bigger um, force at work um, as another kind of philosophical framework for this story as we continue to read on. The first person I met was the maid Osan. This was a human much worse than the student. As soon as she saw me, she grabbed me by the neck and threw me outdoors. I sensed I had no chance against her sudden action, so I shut my eyes and let things take their course. But I couldn't endure the hunger and cold any longer. 
I don't know how many times I was thrown out, but because of this, I came to dislike Osan all through. That's one reason why I stole the fish the other day and why I felt so proud of myself. Okay. So another human uh, treating him horribly. Um, um, he still doesn't have any control. And then that last line, that's one reason why I stole the fish the other day and why I felt so proud. Okay, so that's, it's a strange phrasing. Um, it's a, um, a sense of pride in theft. Okay, and it gets us to think about morality. Um, at some point, you've probably heard someone say, of course you wouldn't steal unless you were starving or you had children who were starving, then would you go steal that loaf of bread to feed them, right? Uh, it's that idea. Oh, yeah, I stole, but it's not really my fault. It's this other person's, right? Um, and so I'm justified in this. It's a um, change of cultural norms, a uh, change of cultural morals, um, and so that's, that's an important shift to point out here. When the maid was about to throw me out for the last time, the master of the house made his appearance and asked what all the row was about. The maid turned to him with me hanging limp from her hand and told him that she had repeatedly tried throwing this stray cat out, but that it always kept sneaking into the kitchen again and that she didn't like it at all. The master, twisting his mustache, looked at me for a while and then told the maid to let me in. Um, so who, who twists their mustache? Who, if, if we have a movie and there's someone twisting their mustache, what's that usually indicate? Um, uh, I think in our movies and modern culture, it suggests someone evil, an evil genius, right? Um, but I think here, um, it's very hard to get into a culture from 150 years ago around the other side of the world and know all their cultural, you know, uh, um, indications like that. But I think it's closer to the genius part than the evil, though there might be a, a little bit of, of that too, that indicates he's thinking, right? He then left the room. I took it that the master was a man of few words. The maid, still mad at me, threw me down on the kitchen floor. In such a way, I was able to establish this place as my home. Okay, so student treats him bad, maid treats him bad, the master says he can stay. And again, in, through the lens of fate, he, up to this point, he has no control over his life, right? Everything is being decided for him. So he's at the will of fate. At first, it was very seldom that I got to see my master. He seemed to be a school teacher. Coming home from school, he had shut himself up in the study and would hardly come out for the rest of the day. His family thought him to be very studious, and my master also made out as if he were. But actually, he wasn't as hardworking as they all believed him to be. I'd often sneak up and look into his study only to find him taking a nap. Sometimes I would find him driveling on the book he had been reading before dozing off. Okay, so we get our first indication here, although um, maybe not first, but a good indication why this is an effective framing technique. Everyone in this uh, professor or in the school teacher's life says this person's hardworking, this person's brilliant. <coughs> and the cat says, yeah, well, I'm here when you're not. <laughs> and he is lazy. As, he is just as lazy as he gets. Um, so we're getting a kind of narration that enables us to see behind the scenes. He was a man with a weak stomach, so his skin was somewhat yellowish. Uh, yellowish can sometimes indicate sickness. He looked parched and inactive, yet he was a great consumer of food. After eating as much as he possibly could, he'd take a dose of taka distes and then open a book. It's a, a tonic for the stomach or a tincture for the stomach. After reading a couple of pages, however, he'd become drowsy and again commenced drooling. 
This was his daily routine. Um, though I'm a cat myself, at times I think that school teachers are very fortunate. If I were to be reborn a man, I would without a doubt become a teacher. If you can keep a job and still sleep as much as my master did, even cats could manage such a profession. But according to my master, and he makes it plain, there's nothing so hard as teaching. Especially when his friends come to visit him, he does a lot of complaining. So, um, first, this passage always gets me to uh, flash back and think of how many times I've complained about how busy I am as a, as a professor. Um, and, uh, you know, think about if there were any times I exaggerate it, so it calls me out here. Um, and so, in that way, it could be a, a satire on educators or school teachers, right? So that's something we want to keep in our mind. Um, but again, we get the be behind the scenes look here, right? And, and also um, this kind of shifting point of view again that, um, oh, even a cat could do this, right? Um, something that humans tend to think is so hard. He's saying even a cat could do it. When I first came to his home, nobody but the master was nice to me. Wherever I went, they would kick me around and I was given no other consideration. The fact that they haven't given me a name, even as of today, goes to show how much they care for me. That's why I try to stay close to my master. So even though the master is lazy and and um, not as hard as he presents himself as hardworking, um, this cat cares for him and appreciates him. Uh, the master gave him his home and treats him better than any other human he's come into contact with. In coming to live with human beings, I've had the chance to observe them. And the more I do, the more I come to the conclusion that they're terribly spoiled especially the children. When they feel like it, they hold you upside down or cover your head with a bag, and at times they throw you around or try squeezing you into the cooking range, and on top of that, should you as much as bear a claw to try to stop them, the whole family is after you. The other day, for instance, I tried sharpening my claws just for a second on a straw mat of the living room when the missus noticed me. She got furious, and from then on, she won't let me in the sitting room. I can be cold and shivering in the kitchen, but they never take the trouble to bother about me. When I met Shiro across the street, whom I'm respected, she kept telling me there was nothing as inconsiderate as humans. Okay, so let's, let's think about this framing technique a little more and the use of anthropomorphism. So, it's challenging our views on human customs, actions, morals, right? In a way that if you have the cat doing this, it's humorous, it's satire, it's, it's unusual, right? Um, where if you have a human saying these things, oh, we're so spoiled, we're so brutal, we're so, you know, don't care about anyone else and all this stuff, um, it, it wouldn't be a good read, right? It would be uh, um, it would be aggressive and and uninteresting and probably depressing and all that. So instead, by putting in the point of view of the cat, it shows us from a different perspective that we don't think of, and also enables it to not um, get us all upset or mad or or disagree, right? Um, so that's kind of the power of, of personification or anthropomorphism in that way. Um, it gets you to rethink who we are and what we are. Only the other day, four cute little kins were born to Shiro, but the student who lives with the family threw all four of them into a pond behind the house on the third day. Shiro told me all this in tears and said that in order for us cats to fulfill parental affection and to have a happy life, we'll have to overthrow the human race. Yes, what she said was all very logical. Mikey next door was extremely furious when I told him about Shiro. He said that humans did not understand the right of possession of others. With us cats, however, 
the first one that finds the head of a dried sardine or the navel of a gray mullet gets the right to eat it. Should anyone try to violate this rule, we're allowed to use force in order to keep our fine. But humans depend on their great strength to take what is legally ours away from us and think it right. Okay, so again, we get how cruel humans are. Um, it also gets us to think how random some of our values or morals are. Um, for example, um, when you hear about a human uh, abusing a cat or a dog, most Americans tend to get upset, right? Uh, tend to think that's awful, that's horrible. Uh, it's often a gut reaction. Uh, we put people in jail for it, like Michael Vick, right? Um, however, you could uh, beat a cat or a dog on the end of one street and get thrown in jail for it. On the other end of that street, you could hit a pig or a cow over the head with a sledgehammer in a uh, kill shop, right? And you get paid $15 an hour to do it, right? And that's socially acceptable. That's morally acceptable. Even though biologically pigs are smarter than dogs. Um, and so it's a moral structure that we've created that says, even though this animal's smarter than a dog or a cat, um, in our society, it's okay to kill or hurt um, or be cruel to the cow or pig or chicken or whatever. Um, but it's not okay to do that to a cat or a dog, right? That's what our culture sets that up. And you say, but of course, right? Uh, that only makes sense. Well, it only makes sense from our cultural cave, right? From within our cultural cave. Um, if you're looking at us from the outside, say you're uh, from India, right? Uh, in India, um, cows are viewed as holy, right? And to abuse or to hurt or to eat a cow is a horrendous act um, and would be looked down upon. So we would be viewed as cruel, inhumane, um, and horrific murderers, right, from outside of our cultural cave. On the other end of it, um, I have some friends from the Middle East who, uh, um, when uh, I remember being in a classroom with uh, my friend from Jordan, and one of my American students comes in with a little dog and says uh, to the professor, I'm really, really sorry, but I couldn't find someone to watch my dog and there, I have no place to put her. I need her to come in with me tonight. And, uh, um, uh, but she's really good. She won't make a peep, right? And the professor, of course, said, okay, okay. Well, she happened to sit by the door and my friend from Jordan sat by the window. At the end of class, the girl with the dog um, was talking to the professor and what I noticed was my friend from Jordan would make every excuse there was to not leave the classroom I couldn't get her to leave the classroom and later uh, I found out in a conversation it's because she was afraid of the dog this little itty you know cute little dog she was afraid of and after knowing more and learning more about our culture, um, throughout the Middle East, most dogs and cats are wild. They're not pets. They're not considered. And so they view it the same as if you took a raccoon and brought it into the house. You know, you might be a little uneasy at that, right? So within our cultural cave, certain norms are okay, right? Um, but outside of our cultural cave, um, those norms look strange. So let's see, coming to think of it, here's some more commentary on, uh, on humans. The way they act according to their whims is another word for selfishness. Again, commentary on, on humans uh, from an outside perspective. So let's skip down a little bit and we'll go to uh, um, the conversation between the cats. 
Uh, I live here in the school teacher's house. I thought so. You sure are skinny. Gathering from his rudeness, I couldn't imagine him coming from a very good family. But judging from his plump body, he seemed to be well fed and able to enjoy an easy life. As for myself, I couldn't refrain from asking, and who are you? Me? Huh? I'm Kuro, living at the rickshaw man's place. And uh, let's just pause there for a second in case you don't know what a rickshaw man is. Uh, this is, uh, um, they drive these little carts, uh, and this is an older picture, um, actually about 50 years after the story we're reading about. Um, but you can imagine that the rickshaw driver, it's not a prestigious profession, right? It's a, um, close to the equivalent of a taxi driver, but perhaps viewed as a little lower in Japanese society at that time. Uh, it's hard work. It's not paid very well. Um, and uh, although I imagine you get some good sunlight and exercise. <laughs> okay, so. So this was the cat living at the rickshaw man's house. He was known in the vicinity as being awfully unruly. Actually, he was admired within the home of the rickshaw man, but having no education, nobody else befriended him. He was a hoodlum from which others shied. When I heard him tell me who he was, I felt somewhat uneasy, and at the same time, I felt slightly superior. With the intention of finding out how much learning he had, I asked him some questions. I was just wondering which of the two is greater, the rickshaw man or the school teacher? What a question. The rickshaw man, naturally. Just take a look at your teacher. He's all skin and bones, he snorted. You look extremely strong. Most probably living at the rickshaw man's house, you get plenty to eat. What? I don't go unfed anywhere. Stick with me for a while instead of going around in circles in the tea patch and you'll look better yourself in less than a month. Sure, someday maybe, but to me it seems as though the school teacher lives in a bigger house than the rickshaw man I purred. Huh, what if the house is big? That doesn't mean you get your belly full there, does it? Okay, so what we have here are some so a commentary on social class, a commentary on social norms, a commentary on values, uh, value structure, right? Um, so this is very much tied to Plato's allegory of the cave, uh, just as the, um, um, the prisoners were, were uh, having contests over who could name the shadows quickest and stuff like that um, to show and maintain social status inside the cave. Inside this cultural cave, right, um, they're saying what matters the most is not how big your cave is, right? What matters most is how full your belly is. Okay, so he's upending a cultural norm. And you can imagine that being kind of a commentary on materialism to begin with, you know? So um, what's it matter how big your house is? Are you being fed, you know, physically or even spiritually, right? Since then, we've often talked together. Whenever we do, Kira always commences bragging, as one living with a rickshaw man would. Okay, so now this uh, lowly, you know, cab-like driver um, is viewed as much higher social status as the school teacher. Uh, which, by the way, in, in Japanese society, the school teacher is considered one of the most honorable people there could be. Um, you have uh, leaders of business and uh, educators are at the top rungs of society. Uh, it's so much so that uh, my wife works with international students and she often has to talk to professors about working with students from Asian countries in that a lot of those countries, uh, this cultural norm is not to look a teacher or professor in the eyes. Uh, that because they are of a higher social status, you're supposed to always avert your gaze and, and look downward when there's a professor or teacher talking to you. 
Um, and so my wife often has to hold kind of cultural awareness lessons on how it's not a sign of disrespect, it's actually a sign of respect, right? So by the way, how many rats have you killed? Intellectually, I'm much more developed than Kuro, but when it comes to using strength and showing bravado, there is no comparison. I was prepared for something like this, but when he actually asked me the question, I felt extremely embarrassed. But facts are facts, I could not lie to him. To tell you the truth, I've been wanting to catch one for a long time, but the opportunity has never come. So he's saying he's smarter than Kuro, but obviously Kuro is better at catching mice, right? Um, so um, Kuro twitched the whiskers which stood out straight from his muzzle and laughed hard. Kuro is conceited as those who brag usually are, so when I find him being sarcastic, I try to say something to appease him. In this way, I am able to manage him pretty well. Having learned this during our first meeting, I stayed calm when he laughed. I realized that it would be foolish to commit myself now by giving unasked for reasons. I figured it best at this stage to let him brag about his own adventures, and so I purred quietly. Being as old as you are, you've probably caught a lot of rats in your, yourself. I was trying to get him to talk about himself, and as I expected, he took the bait. Well, can't say a lot, maybe about 30 or 40. He was very proud of this and continued. I could handle one or two hundred rats alone, but when it comes to weasels, they're not to my liking. A weasel once gave me a terrible time. Okay, so again, this is even clearer uh, example of prisoners in the cave uh, measuring and counting and um, figuring out social status by the shadows, um, by identifying shadows. Um, here, they're creating a social structure, a value structure, out of how many rats or mice uh, you create, right? And we talked about this a little bit in the Allegory of the Cave video, that um, in our society, we have some pretty random values uh, for how uh, we judge who is valuable in our society. So. Um, you often get millions and millions of dollars for being able to hit a bat with a ball together or uh, um, being able to act or sing or um, many other move money around in certain ways, right? And so we have really random value systems with who should get paid the most and who not, right? A soldier barely gets an extremely low paycheck, um, but a, a, you know, uh, an athlete or a um, musician or that who does well gets paid a lot. Um, and that's what Plato was talking about. Challenge those value structures. Determine should we really be living by those value structures. Okay, so <clears throat> here is a kind of an example of metafiction. So let's take a look in on this. Listening to all this from the veranda, veranda, I couldn't help wondering what my master would write in his diary about that conversation. This artist was a person who took great pleasure in fooling others, as if he did not realize how his joke about Andrea del Sarto hurt my master. He boasted more. When playing jokes, some people take them so seriously that they reveal great comic beauty, and it's a lot of fun. The other day I told a student that Nicholas Nickleby had advised Gibbon to translate his great story of the French Revolution from a French textbook and to have it published under his own name. This student has an extremely good memory and made a speech at the Japanese literature circle quoting everything I had told him. There were about a hundred people in the audience and they all listened very attentively. Then there's another time. One evening at a gathering of writers, the conversation turned to Harrison's historical novel, Theophano. I said that it was one of the best historical novels ever written, especially the part where the heroine dies. That really gives you the creeps. That's what I said. An author who was sitting opposite me was one of those types who cannot and will not say no to anything. He immediately voiced opinion that this that that was a most famous passage. I knew right away he had never read any more of that story than I had. Okay, 
So if I was to say this scene of this artist talking about being uh, basically bullcrapping, right, um, at literary events, um, if this was a commentary on literature itself, the nature of fiction or literature itself, um, what could he be saying? You know, what by saying uh, there's all these people just making stuff up and agreeing with each other and pretending to know stuff they don't, well, he could very much be saying that these wealthy academics are full of crap, right? Couple this together with uh, a school teacher who claims to be hardworking, but's really lazy. And this is a social criticism of uh, educated, high ed highly educated society. And in Japanese culture, that's, that's kind of controversial. You know, these very, very well-respected educators he's critiquing. Okay, so this gets us to the, um, the final, the end of the text here. Um, and I want to point out a literary technique he's using. Uh, so first, I'm going to read this paragraph. And I want you to think how this paragraph, it's, it's different than most of the rest of the story. Why he would use it uh, towards, to wrap up his story and why, um, what purpose this description has. The red leaves of the maple tree were beginning to show contrast to the green of the pines in there, here and there. The maples shed their foliage like dreams of the past. The fluttering petals of red and white fell from the tea plants one after another until there were none remaining. The sun slanted its rays deeper and deeper into the southern veranda and seldom did a day pass that the late autumn wind didn't blow. I felt as though my napping hours were being shortened. My master still went to school every day and coming home, he had still bought home so Okay, actually, I'm sorry. I wanted to stop after that first paragraph. So the purpose of that, what, think about um, in the short story that every single line of description is important, right? Um, and that to spend a whole paragraph on description, that's saying I'm doing something here, right? Um, and so red leaves of the maple tree, what's that indicate? It indicates it's fall, right? What happens in fall? The plants begin to shed and symbolically die, right? Um, they shed their foliage like dreams of the past, right? So, um, and then red and white fell from the tea plants. So nature's slowly dying, right? I felt as though my napping hours were being shortened. So in other words, all of this um, scenario is coming to an end. But what do we know about fall? Fall heads into winter, right? A kind of symbolic death. Um, but ultimately, it leads into the next spring as well. It's a cycle. It continues going and going and going. Um, so the next paragraph, we have uh, kind of the cycle of the, his master's life, right? Uh, he continues going on his day-to-day -day activities. Um, and then it ends with, I still had not, nothing much to eat, so I didn't become very fat. But I was healthy enough. I didn't become sick like Kuro, and as always, I took things as they came. I still didn't try to catch rats, and I still hated Osan the maid. I still didn't have a name, but you can't always have what you want. I resigned myself to continue living here at the home of the school teacher as a cat without a name. Okay, so um, how does fate fit in there, right? Um, he's resigned to not have a name. He's resigned to live there. He's resigned to not becoming fat, right? Uh, but getting enough food. Um, and because he's accepted all that, he ends up okay, right? Where Kiro always wanted more and more and more, and he ended up sick, right? So there's a commentary there. If you accept things uh, as they are, you will be okay, right? Um, 
So what's interesting about that is it's uh, a Japanese philosophy. Okay, so uh, let me find this here. Um, something called Shogunai. Um, and I think the reason I want to point this out is I think it helps us understand the story better. Um, it's, a, it's translated as it can't be helped. It's often used to describe Japanese culture, thinking of values. It's essentially a philosophy. It says that if something's out of your control, it's better just to quickly accept it and move on, right? Where if something's out of your control in the West, we're taught from an early age, we should do everything we can to change it, right? Or we should mourn it, or we should um, grow frustrated and angry, or you know, have an emotional reaction and then fight to change or work to change it, right? Where in Japanese culture, this idea of shogunai says, no, it's out of my control. Just move on. There's more to life, right? Um, so how could that be a positive thing in society and negative? Well, a positive is it helps. Uh, it's been shown throughout uh, sociology and history to help the Japanese deal with horrors like um, uh, the bombings in World War II uh, in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki or a recent disaster in Fukushima, right? Um, that it's, uh, uh, they often recover from disasters very quickly, Re recover. Um, now, the problems that it could have is often Japanese don't tend to stand up for themselves as much as they should. Um, so for instance, uh, um, often people won't be bothered to vote or to participate in government or to work to change things because shogunai, it's beyond my control, right? So that framework helps us understand the story and uh, I think it helps us get out of our cultural cave and for a moment get in this Japanese perspective, right? A different cultural cave and say, how would our life be different if instead of getting upset, angry, working to change things, instead, we accepted and moved on, right? Accepted and moved on, right? I think that's very challenging to a Western mindset. And so it's something that Plato uh, would say that we should at least be open to. Okay, so I want to um, just hit on a couple more things quick. Um, first, I think we hit on all the questions from the homework. Um, it challenges things like economic class and status and careers. It uh, says, hey, the rickshaw man is greater than the school teacher or this highly respected school teacher is actually quite lazy, right? Um, and then, uh, um, uh, but I wanna hit on one last thing. Uh, if we assume this story was illustrative of Japanese views on pets like cats, then what does it indicate about the Japanese? And how do you think Americans view pets differently? So um, first, I'll tell you right up front, it's not illustrative of Japanese views on pets, right? Um, and so that's always one of the things we wanna avoid is making big generalizations like that. Sometimes in analyzing literature, we need to, right? Um, but in something like this, it could lead us astray. So where Americans, we tend to anthropomorphize or personify cats and dogs and treat them like little mini humans, right? And when you do that, it actually um, changes the way a society or culture acts, right? Um, so the Japanese, just to give you a little background on this, Japanese have had a long relationship with cats. Uh, over a thousand years ago, the upper class were already living with them. Uh, and they have shrines that worship cats as gods across Japan. Um, so uh, the Japanese believe in Shintoism and uh, probably a little closer to this, animism, uh, that every living being has a soul, including cats, right? So if it has a soul, it should be respected. They actually have a cat island, right, uh, where cats, there's uh, uh, 100 cats to every 15 residents. 
Uh, they have cat cafes. Um, although these are popping up all over the U.S. now as well, where you can go have coffee or drinks and sit with a bunch of cats. Um, but traditionally, they're viewed as good luck. A uh, popular Japanese figurine, uh, and I'll let you guys pronounce that, <laughs> is typically uh, believed to bring blessings. Um, and you'll see this symbol if you watch any anime or anything to do with Japanese. Um, um, and according to Japanese legend, a landlord witnessed a cat waving a paw at him. Intrigued by this gesture, he came close to the cat when suddenly a lightning bolt struck the exact place he was previously standing in. The landlord believed that his good fortune was because of the cat's actions. Hence, the beckoning hand became a symbol of good luck. Um, so why is this story so different from actual Japanese culture? Right? Why are cats portrayed very differently in this story? All the humans are treating them awfully, right? Um, first, it's uh, because of the time period. It's a different time period, right? Um, but even so, they were still treated a little better. Um, also, individual circumstances, right? Um, so it's an individual story about a few cats in one neighborhood. It could be different in many different ways. Um, most importantly, and probably most likely here, it's merely a, a narrative device. Um, something that could be used to view humans from an outside perspective. And it's always important to just think, maybe a cat is just a cat. Uh, just like a scene can sometimes just be a scene. Water imagery can just be water. Sometimes you don't have to overthink it. But in this case, I think the most likely culprit is it's a narrative device. Okay, so um, also it's important to to point out, so here's on naturalism, that how uh, um, the third last paragraph, uh, the nature paralleled the story. Um, that's called naturalism, and it's a literary genre that started in the late 19th century in literature, film, theater, and art. Um, and so it's um, um, right around this time period. Of course, it's a little more Western, uh, but it occurred in Japan as well. Um, and this movement suggested the role of family, background, social conditions, and environment uh, shaped human character. So that the environment, uh, humans, uh, social conditions were all intertwined and could not be separated. Thus, naturalistic writers tend to write stories based on the idea that the environment determines or governs human character. So. Uh, when a uh, human dies, uh, it's a good idea, uh, a naturalistic um, technique to make it winter, right? Um, when a, a new life is born, it's going to most ha often happen as a narrative device in spring, right? Things of that nature. Um, and so it can, it can be used to indicate that to give foreshadow, to give the reader a hint, right? Um, and so it's good to at least look for naturalism, especially in short stories where, uh, again, any setting should be looked at closely to figure out what the author's doing. Okay, that's where we're gonna wrap up for now. Um, you can uh, go ahead and read the next story. Uh, it should be The Lottery by Shirley Jackson. Uh, I know many of you have read this in high school. Um, hopefully we're going to look at a few different things, but more importantly, I think it's going to help us understand other texts we're looking at this semester. So uh, that's all for now. Thanks.